Chapter 29 The wall before us went up in a flash of green energy. Megan tried to turn the cycle and stop. We skidded through the churning green smoke, pebbles scattering, scattering under our tires, and slid out onto the street on the other side, where we came to a halt. Megan's body was braced for impact. She seemed stunned. The enforcement cyclist burst from the smoke. I swung the gauss gun and blasted his cycle out from underneath him. The shot turned the whole motorcycle into a flash of green energy, vaporizing it and part of the officer on it. His body went rolling. The gun was amazing. There was no recoil, and the shots vaporized instead of really exploding. That left little debris, but gave a great light show and a lot of smoke. Megan turned toward me, a grin splitting her lips. About time you did something, started doing something useful back there. Go, I said. The sound of more cycles was coming from the alleyway. Megan revved our motorcycle, then led us in a darting, stomach-churning pattern through the narrow streets of the slum. I couldn't turn to fire the gun behind us as we drove, so instead I clung to her waist with one hand and settled the gun on her shoulder to steady it, using the iron sco sights, scope folded down to the side. We roared out of an alleyway and skidded toward a blockade. I blasted a hole through a truck for us, then for good measure hit the armored unit with a shot to the leg. Soldiers scatter scattered, yelling, some trying to fire as we sped through the opening I'd made. The armor unit collapsed, and Megan dodged to the side down a dark alley. Shouts and curses sounded behind us as some of the cycles chasing us got caught up in the confusion. Nice work, Tia said in our ears, her voice calm again. I think I can get you to the under streets. There's an old tunnel up ahead at the bottom of a flood gully. You might have to blast your way through some walls, though. I think I can hit a wall or two, I said, so long as they aren't very good at dodging. Be careful, Prof said. That gun drinks energy like Tia with a six-pack of cola. That power cell could run a small city, but it will only give you a dozen shots at best. Abraham, you still with us? I'm here. You in the bolt hole? Yes, bandaging my wound. It's not too bad. I'll be the judge of that. I'm almost to you. Cody, status. I can see the limo, Cody said in my ears. Megan took another corner. I've mostly shaken pursuit. I've got a tensor. I'll hit the limo with a grenade, then use the tensor to drill myself down to the under streets. Not an option, Prof said. It'll take you too long to drill down that far. Wall, Tia said. Got it, I said, blasting a hole through a wall at the end of the alleyway. We roared out into a backyard, and I blasted a hole in another wall, letting us cut into the next yard. Megan turned us to the right, then drove us through a very narrow slot between two houses. Go left, Tia said as we reached the street. Prof, Cody said, I can see the limo. I can hit it. Cody, I don't. I'm taking the shot, Prof, Cody said. Abraham's right. Steelheart's going to come after us for this. We need to hurt him as much as we can, while we can. All right. Turn left, Tia said. We turned. I'm sending you through a large building, Tia said. Can you handle that? Gunfire sprayed against the wall beside us, and Megan cursed, hunkering down farther. I held the gauss gun in its sweaty grip, feeling terribly exposed with my back to the enemy. I could hear the cycles back there. They really seem to want you to, Tia said softly. They're pulling a lot of resources toward you, and... Calamity! What? I said. My video feed just went out. Something's wrong. Cody? Little busy, he grunted. More gunfire sounded from behind. Something hit the cycle, jarring us, and Megan cursed. The building, Tia, I said. How do we find that building? We'll lose them inside. Second right, Tia told us. Then straight to the end of the road. It's an old mall, and the gully is just behind it. I was looking for other routes, but... This will work, Megan said curtly. David, be ready to open this place up for us. Got it, I said, steadying the gun, though it was harder now that she'd picked up speed. We took a corner, then turned toward a large, flat structure at the end of the road. I vaguely remembered malls from the days before Calamity. They'd been marketplaces, all enclosed. Megan was driving fast and heading right at it. I took aim carefully and blasted through a set of steel doors in the front. We shot through the smoke, entering the heavy blackness of an abandoned building. The headlight of the cycle showed shops on either side of us. The place had been looted long ago though a lot of wares remained in the shops. 
Clothing that had turned to steel wasn't particularly useful. Megan wove easily through the mall's open corridors, taking us up a frozen escalator onto the second floor. Engines echoed throughout the building as enforcement cycles followed us in. Tia couldn't guide us any longer, it appeared, but Megan seemed to have an idea of what she was doing. From the balcony above, I got a shot at the cycles following us. I hit the ground in front of them, taking a chunk out of the floor and causing several to skid out, the others scattering for cover. None seemed to have drivers as skilled as Megan. Wall up ahead, Megan said. I blasted, then glanced at the energy meter on the side of the gauss gun. Prof was right. I drained it pretty quickly. We had maybe a couple of shots left. We roared out into open air, and the gravitronics on the cycle engaged, softening our landing as we fell one story to the street below. We still hit hard. The cycle wasn't intended to take jumps that high. I grunted, my backside and legs hammered from the impact. Megan immediately punched the vehicle forward down a narrow alleyway behind the mall. I could see the ground fall away up ahead. The gully. We only had to... A sleek black copter rose out of the gully in front of us, and the rotary guns on its sides began to spin up. Not a chance, I thought, raising the gauss gun with both hands, sighting. Megan ducked lower and the cycle hit the edge of the gully. The copter started firing. I could see the pilot's helmet through the glass of the cockpit. I took the shot. I'd often dreamed of doing incredible things. I'd imagined what it would be like to work with the Reckoners, to fight the epics, to actually do things instead of sitting around thinking about them. With that shot, I finally got my chance. I hung in the air, staring down a hundred-ton death machine and squeezed the trigger. I popped the copter's canopy dead on, vaporizing it and the pilot inside. For a moment, I felt like the epics must, like a god. And then I fell out of the seat. I should have expected it. Going into freefall in a 20-foot ravine with two hands on my gun and none on my ride made it kind of inevitable. I won't say I was happy to find myself plummeting toward broken legs and probably worse. But that shot, that shot had been worth it. I didn't feel much of the fall. It happened so fast. I hit mere moments after realizing I'd lost my seat, and I heard a crunch. That was followed by a boom that deafened me, and that was followed by a wave of heat. I lay there, stunned as my vision swam. I found myself facing the wreckage of the copter, which burned nearby. I felt numb. Suddenly, Megan was shaking me. I coughed, rolling over, and looked up at her. She'd pulled off her helmet so I could see her face. Her beautiful face. She actually seemed concerned about me. That made me smile. She was saying something. My ears rang and I squinted, trying to read her lips. I could barely hear the words, Up, you slants! Get up! You aren't supposed to shake someone who suffered a fall, I mumbled. Might have a broken back. You'll have a broken head if you don't start moving! But, idiot, your jacket absorbed the blow. Remember the one you wore to keep you from getting killed? They're supposed to make up for you doing stupid things like letting go of me in mid-air. It's not my intention to let go of you, I mumbled. Not ever. She froze. Wait, had I just said that out loud? Jacket, I thought, wiggling my toes, then raising both arms. The jacket's shielding di device protected me. And, and we're still being chased. Calamity. I was a slant. I rolled onto my knees and let Megan help me to my feet. I coughed a few times, but felt more stable by the moment. I let go of her and was pretty steady by the time we reached the cycle, which she'd landed without crashing. Wait, I said, looking around. Where is... The gauss gun lay in several pieces where it had fallen and hit a steel rock. I felt a sinking feeling, though I knew the gun wasn't nearly as useful to us now. We couldn't use it to pretend to be an epic any longer, not now that enforcement had seen me shooting it. Still, it was a pity to lose such a nice weapon, particularly after leaving my own rifle in the van. I was making a real habit of that sort of thing. I climbed onto the cycle behind Megan, who pulled on her helmet again. The poor machine was looking pretty ragged, scratched and dented, the windshield cracked. One of the Gravtronics, a palm-sized oval on the right side, didn't light up like the others anymore. 
But the cycle still started, and the engine roared as Megan drove us down the ravine toward a large tunnel up ahead. It looked like it led into the sewage system, but a lot of things like that were misleading in New Cago, with the Great Transversion and the creation of the Understreets. Hey, are y'all... Cody said softly in our ears. By some miracle, I'd kept my mobile and earpiece through the fall. Something strange is going on. Something very, very strange is going on. Cody, Tia said. Where are you? Limo's done, he said. I shot out one of the tires and it drove itself into a wall. I had to eliminate six soldiers before I could approach. Megan and I passed into the tunnel, the darkness deepening. The ground sloped downward. I was vaguely familiar with the area, and I figured this would lead us into the understreets near Gibbon Street, a relatively unpopulated area. What about Comflex? Prof asked Cody. He wasn't inside the limo. Maybe one of the enforcement officers you shot was actually Comflex, Tia said. No, Cody said. I found him in the trunk. The line was quiet for a moment. You're sure it's him? Prof asked. Well, no, Cody said. Maybe they had some other epic tied up in their trunk. Either way, the dowser says this lad's very powerful, but he's unconscious. Shoot him, Prof said. No, Megan said. Bring him. I think she's right, Prof, Cody said. If he's tied up, he can't be that strong. Either that or they've used his weakness to make him impotent. We don't know his weakness, though, Prof said. Put him out of his misery. I'm not shooting an unconscious fellow, Prof, Cody said. Not even an epic. Then leave him. I was torn. Epics deserve to die, all of them. But why was he unconscious? What were they doing with him? Was it even complex? John, Tia said, we might need this. If it is complex, he could tell us things. We might even be able to use him against Steelheart or bargain for our escape. He's not supposed to be very dangerous, I admitted, speaking into the line. My lip was bleeding. I'd hit bit it when I'd fallen, and now that I was a little more aware of things, I realized my leg was aching and my side was throbbing. The jackets helped, but they were far from perfect. Fine, Prof said. Bolt hole seven, Cody. Don't take him to the base. Leave him tied up, blindfolded, and gagged. Do not talk to him. We need to deal with him together. Right, Cody said. I'm on it. Megan and David, Prof said. I want you to... I lost the rest as gunfire erupted around us. The cycle, battered as it was, spun out and went down, right onto the side where the gravtronics were broken.